This elk calling seminar has been brought to you by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, Elk Nut Outdoors and the Elk Nut Mobile App, Got Game Technologies, and Elk Addicts. This event has been sponsored by XO Mountain Gear, Sneaky Hunter, Elk Shape, Trips for Trade, Nature's Paint, and Phelps Game Calls. Well, how's everybody doing this evening? Well, good. Me too. Looks like there's a, quite a crowd here. I actually wasn't expecting nowhere near this many people. But that's good. And, hey, I appreciated what uh, Chris had to say too. I really did. I enjoyed that. So hopefully, hopefully everybody else did as well. You know, with, with elk season coming on real close, <clears throat> it seems like everybody is uh, kind of have, has elk on the brain. I know I do. But before we get into that, if uh, there's a few of you out there that don't know who I am, my name is Paul Medell, and uh, I'm the owner of ElkNet Outdoors. I uh, have studied and researched elk vocalizations, their mannerisms, their behaviors for over 35 years. I, uh, my son and I, we've killed 63 elk with bows in the last 29 years. Uh, this Friday will be the 30th year that we've hunted together. We've been able to go out every opening day, and that's kind of special to me to be able to do that with your own son, you know, for, for those many years and, and to have success with it on over-the-counter uh, hunts. Uh, as I said, we've had Elk Night Outdoors for probably uh, 20, 22 years now. Uh, I used to write for Elk Hunter Magazine for almost two years. I've uh, been uh, talked about and had articles about Elk Night Outdoors in 20 different magazines. I've been in Outdoor Live three times. Uh, I've given probably 80 seminars all over the place. Just kind of giving you a little rundown of, you know, who I am if you guys have never heard of me and stuff. So that's kind of, you know, the way that we've been rolling. And I, I've had a passion for elk forever. And ever since I was 11 years old. I'm 64 now and it hasn't waned one little bit. And I'm just as excited now to be able to go out there and hunt elk as I was when I first started bow hunting 29 years ago, I've hunted elk longer than that, but I started bow hunting 29 years ago when my son turned 12. And he's killed a bull every year, over the counter bull with a bow since then. And so, you know, we've had a lot of fun. We, we've been through a lot, learning the different sounds that elk make and, 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 and the different behavior, and like I say, the mannerisms. And by studying those things, we started carrying those into our hunting. So, when I'm talking about research and study, this is outside of hunting times. We're talking about, you know, June, July, August, and, 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 and being with the elk when there's really no pressure on them, even though they're over-the-counter units. And this is where we really started to delve in. And I say we, I mean me. It was me. My son wasn't even hardly born then at that time. I had, I had such interest knowing that they had a language, and it was all by emotion or tone or cadence of the sound. And... Once I started realizing that, I could see that our hunting, our efforts in, in hunting elk, especially archery during September, it just started to escalate. We, we, we called in a lot of elk, and we were, we were calling in elk for other people. And they were going, how are you doing this? And I, I told them, I said, it's through the elk vocalization, understanding the different sounds that elk make. And there's really not a whole ton of them, but what I do want to talk about is three main sequences that I use in the month of September. And there's actually five of us in the elk nut uh, team. Uh, my son and I, and then three others that are basically solo hunters. We don't hunt together. My son and I will hunt together, or we hunt apart, but it's not like we hunt as a group, not at all. These guys, they just happened to be part of the team when we started all hunting together. And who knew it was going to stay together for almost 30 years? I mean, we didn't. It's just one year was after another, another, another. And, and that's kind of how things rolled. And, and I also want to mention that all this information that I'm going to share with you is on the app. So you don't have to worry about trying to remember it all or take notes or memorizing anything because I'm going to share some stuff with you that I know you haven't tried. I know you haven't. Most people have not. And maybe you've done some of it or a little bit of it, but I'm going to try to put it in perspective here why we do the things we do and, and, and receive the success we do. I would say that when we're working a bull, when we target a bull on over-the-counter hunts, 90% odds, I'm gonna have that bull and bow range. That one bull. I'm not trying to get 10 bulls to get one or two in. I want every single bull to come in. So I have to tailor my calling of what is going to actually fit that bull. So on the three sequences that I, I try to fall on throughout the year, and again, you know, you're tweaking things and messing around with things from time to time. But here's the three main ones. 
I'm relying on advertising sequence. I'm relying on what I call challenging or full tilt sequences, means bulls are extremely aggressive. And the main one, without question, is the slow play sequence. It's the slow play breeding sequence. And that's the one that I got targeted for on uh, outdoor or uh, field and stream when they heard this and how many elk were falling to it, that they wanted me to put it in a magazine. And so they <coughs> kind of did the articles and did this and that, but it got pretty popular. But I've tweaked it now since then. This was like 10 years ago when the first one came out. And so now I have it fine-tuned. As far as I'm concerned, it's fine-tuned because it pulls in just about 99% of the bulls. And I'm talking quiet bulls. I'm talking bulls you might know are there, or you heard one bugle. That's it. First thing in the morning, maybe still dark, and you heard a bull bugle half a mile away, and he won't say another thing. Now, we all know those are the hardest bulls to kill. They're the hardest bulls to pull in. Anybody can hunt the bulls that are screaming everywhere. I mean, they're just talking and going, and there's multiple bulls. you got hot cows going. Those, I have, I have a tactic for them, too, and we're going to talk about it. But first, I'm going to go into advertising, and I'm going to discuss real quick the sounds that we're going to be talking about this evening. We're going to be talking about a social cow sound. We're going to be talking about a regathering sound where cows, bulls, any of them will use a sound to bring other elk their way. They're asking them to come over by changing the tone. Then you have one where they're talking to them or asking them urgently, demandingly, quick, get over here now. Come on, we need to regather. We need to get out of here. And that's how elk will do it on certain tones. Just like if one were to bark. We're not talking a nervous grunt. We're talking a bark, which is a mountainside clearing event. And you hear that elk, you know, you hear kind of go. <whistles> and you hear an elk do that and it does it repetitiously. You're going to notice that it's a mountainside clearing event and they're gone. There is no if, ands, or buts. That's a very urgent tone. And... And so when you start realizing what some of those sounds will mean, and again, it's repetitious when it's a bark. When it's a nervous grunt, it's not. It's a single note fashion. So we're going to talk about that contact buzz, that urgent tone, regathering, and a social mew. Those are the cow sounds that we're going to concentrate on. For bull sounds, on any of those three, I'm usually going to be using a locator type sound to find elk. I will end up using a challenge. I will end up using some glunks. I'm going to be doing a lot of panting, a lot of voice sounds when I'm doing the slow play. And I'm just going to go through these. And the, the point is that every one of these sounds represent a message or a condition that this elk is feeling, the emotion. Just like when you hear a dog barking. If you had your dog in the house and it's sitting there and you're not paying attention to it, and it just goes, Whoa! and it's just staring at you. Is he mad? Is he going to tear your leg off? No, it's nothing like that. Maybe he wants to feed you to feed him or throw a toy or whatever. But what if that dog's outside and you hear him <laughs> screaming like crazy? I mean, it gets your attention and you're like, whoa, I mean, he's barking all right, but now there's some real emotion behind it. And he's like, whoa, you know, I better go find out what's going on. There's something out there, cat, dog, intruder. I need to, I need to check this out. So you see how they change their emotion, whether it's a bark or a whine or you're tugging on a toy and he's growling, playing. But outside he's, he's growling like crazy and barking at the same time. You see how he changed it and he changes the message. Nobody has to tell you there's something wrong out there. I need to go out there and check this out. No one has to tell you that. You can hear it. He's not telling you that, but you hear his tone. This is exactly what elk are doing with their bugles. This is what cows are doing with their cow sound. So I started breaking all this down on what each sound was and start using it in sequences. And guys, we take a lot of elk. Actually, the, 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 the five of us, we've killed 204 over-the-counter bulls in 29 years. And all of us are using these types of sequences. And so, we're, I mean, we're way over what 100% would be because we, we, we actually take more elk than that. So, you know, most guys, when you look at stats, if you're doing 10% in an over-the-counter unit, you're doing pretty good. I mean, if you're doing 40, 50, 60, I mean, that's way over. So imagine being in that situation where you're, you're up there in that 95 to 100 consistently. You know, you're having a good time. What that does is it builds your confidence. And what builds my confidence is understanding the sounds. I don't need to see an elk at all. All I have to do is hear it. And if I don't hear one and I see one moving in the timber and he's not making any sounds, that bull is toast. He's done. I know exactly the sequence I'm going to use on him. Let's say I go out next Friday. And I will. I'm going to be out there. What sequence am I going to set on right here? Am I going to go into a full tilt challenging situation? Is that where my mind's going to be set? Is it going to be on a slow play? Is it going to be more in the advertising? What does advertising mean? 
Advertising, when you talk about advertising sounds or calling elk, we talked about those sounds I just did. But if you add rattling to it and you add raking to it, beating the brush, thrashing, doing anything, I consider all those elk sounds. Why? Because you're trying to use a, an attractant uh, uh, to lure them your way, whether it's through a tone or whether it's raking or whatever the case may be. And so those I consider elk sounds. It's elk behavior, but you're, you're trying to accomplish the same thing. <clears throat> Let's say you're going up on Friday and you have a camera set out or two or three or ever how many, and you have elk hitting these water sources, whether they're water holes or wallows, it really doesn't matter. But they're, 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 there's nothing concrete. He's, they're, they're not coming in like clockwork at this particular time or even every day. They're like, wow, they're around, yeah, but there's nothing set in stone. How would I treat that? How would I try to call that bull then? Well, I'll tell you, when you get a bull and he's using that area or a couple of bulls, these bulls know each other and they start leaving their scent around in that area that they're living or staying in. What, you didn't pay the power bill? What here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't even know how to do it. That one. Let's try that. Why don't we just do that? Am I, am I, can everybody hear me all right without that? Yeah. yeah, I do kind of talk kind of loud. And sometimes, and sometimes I even get excited. So you have to bear with me on that. Because a lot of these times I'm talking about these stories or a sequence, I actually can see in my mind how it's unraveling and all these elk I've called in trying them. I mean, these aren't things where I'm saying, hey, this is theory and just give them a shot. No, these are the things we use every year. So when I'm walking and I'm, and I'm checking out a water source and I'm not going to sit. I just, I'm not a sitter. I want to call elk. That is my passion. It's my adrenaline rush in life. I have spot and stocked elk. I've sat, ambushed them. I've, uh, 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 I've uh, spot and stock, like I say, ambush, tree stand. I hate it all. I don't care for it. It's because it's not enough action for me. I need to do something to bring these elk in, even though all those things are productive. But see, I don't, I don't care about saying I just want to kill an elk. I want to kill it my way. I want to kill it where I'm getting the excitement. And at 64, I don't have a lot of those years left where I, I get that kind of excitement. And so I want to keep doing it. And so when I'm going out there, I am trying to bring these elk in or engage them. So when I'm seeing these bulls coming around and they're using this water source, I know they're in the area. And especially I look at the time of day. Why is that important? Because I know that after 9 o'clock, 9.30, those elk are in their bedding area. So where is, how long is an elk in a bedding area? Probably 85% of the day. They're in their bedding area from around 9, 9.30, and they don't start leaving that bedding area until maybe an hour, hour, hour and a half before, before dark. So 85% of the day, where are the elk? They're near their bedding area. I'm going to go where I have the captive audience. So when I see those photos or the time on the camera saying, this one's at noon, and this one's at 10.30, and this one's at 3, I know that waddle's near the bedding area. They can hear me. They're within earshot. Maybe I don't know exactly where they're at, but I don't care. I know they're going to hear me. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to go and display in that area for them. I am going to attract them. I'm not going to use a cow sound. I couldn't care less about a cow sound. The bull doesn't care about a cow sound right now. If they would, they'd be around the cows. But they really don't have any interest in them. Does this mean all bulls down the line 100%? No, but it's the majority. A large majority, they're still in bachelor groups. And some of those bulls will be separate, some are not. But I'm going to attract that bull. And how am I going to do it? I'm going to get over there and I'm going to get near the water. I don't have to be on it. I'm just going to get in that vicinity and I'm going to start raking and I'm going to start thrashing and I'm going to rake and I'm going to rake some more. And so I'm going to display in his area. Most of these bulls that are hanging in these areas right now, they have been marking those areas, believe it or not. They'll stay there for one week to three or four weeks until hunting pressure, wolves or something pushes them out of there. But see, they're kind of territorial temporarily because elk move around. They do not, they're not like whitetails and they're there the whole year. No, they might be here a week, 10 days, two weeks, and then they're over here. Then they're over here. Maybe they don't get that to stay in that area very long because of hunting pressure or wolves or lions, bears, whatever. But the point is when you find them in that area, this is their area. And when you go in there, 
and you start being another bull and they don't know who you are, it draws on their curiosity. So what I do is I like to get in and start raking and I start thrashing and I'll get a little bit louder. And then I'll just make some little noises when I'm in there and I know they can hear me. And so I just kind of... And I'll just start raking. And then once in a while, I'll just kind of hit them with a little bit of a bugle. Nothing monstrous. I'm not, I'm not trying to call them to me. I'm just feeling my oats in this area, and I'm right in their spa. Kind of a... And I just hit right there, and that's it. I'm not calling anymore. I'm pretty much done with it at that point, and I go back to raking, and I go to thrashing, and I'll move around, and I'll make all these, still these same little guttural sounds. Kind of a... And this is just a bull kind of feeling his oats, kind of like what Chris mentioned. Bulls will get like that. They start getting a little frisky. They feel the oncoming of the rut, the stages of the rut coming on. Their testosterone levels are starting to rise. These bulls are getting ready to breed. And so all I'm doing is playing on their curiosity that there's a bull over there in their area. And you cannot believe how many times I've done that and they come sneaking in. They're not, they hardly ever call back. Not at that time. It's possible, but very rare do they do. They just start sneaking in, sneaking in. Now, if I get a bull to engage, I may go ahead and pick up the tone of my bugle and play with him. I'll listen to his emotion. But so many times when I get there and I already know they're there, I'm not looking for elk. I already know they're there. I've seen them on the camera. Or I see the fresh sign around. I'll get, go into those, those areas, and that's how I will display by raking. And You don't have to do a lot of calling. And forget the cow calls. They, they don't care. They really don't. It's not the time to do it. But by playing on that bull sound, they're getting their pecking order down. They're not going to know who you are by your raking or by the one little bugle you gave. And this is very important to elk. Pre-season, pre-rut, they need to know where they are in the pecking order. Who's going to be a herd bull and who isn't. So that's one of my things I like to do. I get very creative when I'm out there sometimes. That's one of my aspects. And, and a lot of times once I start hitting that bugle like that, and the raking, and I'll go maybe 15, 20 minutes and play with it, I start grabbing the antlers. I make them think another bull came in, and he came in where this bull is, and they start sparring, and they just kind of, and I just tick, I hit it, and I'll make all these little noises, and I'll just keep raking and thrashing and hit and just hit him. I'll hit the brush and just crack, and you can't believe how, it, I've heard elk just come running. I killed a nice six point one day, and that's what I was doing. And he came running in. I must have heard him from 300 yards. No bugling, no nothing, just hitting those antlers, making him think something was going on over there. But bulls will come into this kind of thing. Now, here's the nice thing. What if nothing shows up? You haven't heard anything. Nothing. The bull's still over there. The bulls are still over there. They haven't bo you haven't bothered anything. They're still there for the taking. But I can tell you, in most cases, when the elk are in that area, they come sneaking in. They just come popping. And I also notice that when I do this a lot, that they rarely ever come in downwind. They, they, they come right at you. They're coming the shortest route. I hardly ever have to worry about them coming from my backside. They're coming in from my left, from my right, or in front of me. But when I'm doing a little setup like this, I'm making sure that a bull cannot get to a spot and see where the calling's coming from. I immediately take that out of the equation. I do not let him have that. And that's how we take so many of these elk, is, is if I'm solo doing that, he must come, go into search mode, and he must come to my range before he can see the source. If you give him that luxury of 80 yards, 90, 100, because you want to see him coming, that's where he hangs up. He'll hang up, and when they're silent like that, and you don't know, that, they just sit there, and they stand. And they're looking through the tree. They know they should be seeing something. And the next thing you don't know, they're in your move and you're doing something, boom, he's gone. And so you have to remove that. A lot of times these bulls will come in and you don't even know they ever showed up. And they did. And so make sure you get real tight cover. If you look on the app and you go into the breeding call, uh, uh, sequence and the advertising one on the app in a video, I show you exactly how I set up. I show you what the cover is like, what I get behind, what I use for rake and thrashing you know, everything about the setup because it's extremely important. That's probably the number one reason that people lose elk every year that don't get the shot. All the guy does, he does it. He does all the great calling. He's drawn the bull, but his setup is horrible and it cost him a shot so many times. He's behind things. He's, he's too open. He's in front of when he shouldn't be. There's situations when that does work, but a lot of times it doesn't. 
but that is what I like to do early season. I'll even go into bugling if I feel like, man, it's getting to be like the second and third. So now I'm going to go into an advertising sequence where I'm using a lot more bugling. And I'm using that lonesome Charlie type of sound. And so what that means is I'm bugling like this. You guys, I probably called in <clears throat> over 150 bulls doing that. Just those stupid little sounds. And don't move. This is what a bull will do when he goes into an area, especially a new area, a new bull in an area, and he'll advertise. He'll just squeal around. And we're talking early season here. We're not talking about rutting times. And they will go on and on and on. I've called as many as seven bulls in, all in one little group. I didn't even know it was there. And they just come walking in, doom, 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 doom. And they come right in. My son ended up taking the lead one at about 15 yards. And I was probably 35 yards behind him in this one instance. But the point is, is we've called in so many elk doing that. Early season, when they're just, they, they, they don't have any TVs or VCR, they have no iPhones, they have none of that stuff. So when they're out there and they hear it and you just keep it going, most of the time I'm doing that for 20 or 25 minutes. I'm not doing this two or three, you know, a minute. And I'm raking, I'm just pawing, I'm not getting aggressive. I'm just feeling my oats and I'm, I'm, I'm yearning. I'm feeling the urges of the rut. And, you know, you, it's like horses getting frisky on, on, on rainy, foggy mornings, you know. And this is what these elk will do. And so I start using these things as it starts escalating, as the, as the time gets closer to where I think cows can start coming in. But I don't use any cow sounds at that time. Now, has anybody ever tried like that and had any success with it? I want to know. You know, I'll tell you something. My number one pet peeve is hunters don't call enough. But the guys that don't very, do very much calling, they say people call too much. But really, I don't, I don't think I call too much. That reed right there I used, I will go through six of those in the month of September. I will completely thrash them, wear them out. They're done. That's how much we call when we hunt all over the counter just like you guys do. The point is, is it brings elk in. We killed nine bulls last year, the five of us. This is what we do. We call, we call, we call to locate. On a, on, a, on, a, on a normal day outside of this really slow time, once it hits the six, I'm bugling. And I, how often do I bugle? I'll bugle from right here, right, right at my rig. And I have not, I don't have like one spot. I mean, we're hunting the entire, all the, all the zones. We're hunting everywhere. I have over 40 spots that I can go to over the years. I've hunted seven states. I go over, I do the same thing in every state. I don't change anything. I am finding elk. And Chris hunts different uh, a country than we do. I seek out the timber. I do not like open country. I stay away from it because everybody wants to hunt it. And I see them glassing the side by sides going everywhere. I go for the timber. If I see elk in the, in the opening, I don't say anything, nothing. I just watch them, watch them. Once they get in the timber, I own them. That's where I got them right there. And if they're not talking, and maybe I'll get one or two bugles at them and they're not talking, I go straight to the slow play. And the slow play, once I hit around the fifth or the sixth, I will use the slow play on bulls that are not aggressive. A not aggressive bull means he doesn't have any hot cows. He has none. But he still has cows, but he doesn't mind leaving them. I would say... The last probably 15 to 20 bulls that we've taken, I probably called in 15 to 16 of them with the slow play. And I can't even tell you right now, I'm trying to think. In using the slow play, there might have been one in the bulls I've used it on lately that did not, I did not get in and kill. Killed every one of them. The slow play just kicks their butt. And why does the slow play work? Because I play on their instinct to breed. That's what I do. That's the bottom line. There's no secret to it. I play on a bull's instinct to breed. Once they hit around that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, they are so ready to breed. No hot cows. I show them I have the hot cow. That's what I do. I show them I've got one right here. When a cow is coming into estrus, she doesn't make any sound, nothing. I know there's people that will tell you they make an estrus scream and they make these estrus whines, blah, 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 blah. In all the research I've done, all the elk we call, all the elk, all these things that happen to us, I can promise you that cows make no sound at all when they're coming into heat. Nothing. They could care less. Nothing out of the normal. 
When you start hearing people talk about the estrus scream or the estrus buzz, and they've done no research, what happens is these guys are basically out there in September, parts of October, and they hear that sound, and immediately it's something unusual, and that's the sound everybody's heard probably. That's what a cow will do, and she'll do it in all kinds of different volumes, and they hear it like, oh man, that cow's coming into heat. Yeah, right, they're not. I have tons of video of this sound. I can show them doing it in January, February, March, April, May, every month of the year. There's no difference. If that was a breeding sound, would you hear it outside of the rut? I mean, how could you? Come on. They don't, they don't make that sound at that time. Just the bottom line. The point is, it's just another elk sound. It's another sound that they make. That sound, which I told you we would talk about, is especially, especially going to be used in the slow play. That is a sound that is an urgent or demanding sound. Is that you, Tyler? <laughs> Aren't you Tyler? No. Oh, man, I thought that for sure. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to go grab a drink here. I think I might need it. Anyway, the slow play, God, you look like him. I got a picture of you. And <clears throat> we're going to go over the slow play and how it works. Why it, it just hammers these bulls, and especially the hardest bulls there are to, ki to kill and call, to call in and kill. When you're using the ingredients for this recipe, and that's how I look at it, there's ingredients. When you're making a dish, you know a lot of times you're going to make a dish, and the ladies more than anybody can appreciate this. There are certain parts of the ingredients that you have to put in and stir up before you add the next one. You don't just go, everything put in it and expect everything to come out great. There's just times that, that doesn't happen. So this is how the slow play is. You want to use the ingredients at the right time. Here's what I do. I've heard a bull bugle. I'm going to give you an example. Everybody's been through this. Everybody has. You hear a bull bugle or you see him walk in the timber. Either one, it doesn't matter. I do my best to get about 200 yards from him. I could care less about being on top of him. I'm going to bring him all the way to me. If I can get 150, I will. But I'm not, I don't really want to make my, 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 my position known to him at this time. And when I know, because I know he's there, whether by hearing him or saw him, I'm not going to talk to him. It's going to be me and a cow. And I'm only going to talk to her. Now, when a cow starts coming into heat, only a bull will make specific sounds to show anything else, if it hears it, that she's coming into estrus. He will, be, he'll, he will have um, emotional tones, undertones, the way he displays for her, for her for the, he's in the presence of a hot cow. That's what you look for. When you hunt elk long enough, you're going to come in these situations, you're going to hear these bulls that are around hot cows, and they're making all these sounds. And a lot of them I'm doing with my voice. I'm low-keyed because I'm talking to her. I'm not talking to something 150, 300 yards away. She's only right there. See, I'm talking to you guys right here. That's the volume of my voice. I don't need to yell and scream like I'm giving a challenge-type bugle. No, you guys are right there. So, so I'm talking to her, and I'm going to eventually get him to engage. Here's the very first thing I do. I get over there. I get a good setup. I know he, he, he could come in. Once I get him engaged, if I'm solo, I'm going to get him to engage, and I know it. He's going to end up bugling this, this system. And as soon as I, he does, I'm going to listen for his advancement by his bugles getting closer, or I can hear him walk and running. And I'm already picking a spot up ahead. I need to pick a spot up ahead that does not put me out of bow range of where I'm at right there. Because I've had him come sneaking in, not downwind, but just get around me. And I want to make sure I can still have a shot from where I set up secondly. Because on my final thing, I'm going to give sounds from here and go up here. 15, 20, 25 yards and not make another sound once I'm at the end of this and I've got him. So what I'm trying to show you is I'm picking out my setup spot very carefully. He doesn't even know I'm there. So I can get up there and look around and say, I want to be here. And then I'm going to end up going here, here, wherever I think he's coming in from. So I have all this. And it only takes a minute. It's nothing. It's not like you're out there half an hour. It's just boom, 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 boom. And you've got everything planned out how it's going to happen. So now I walk in there. I get set up. That's it. I sit there. Two minutes. I don't make a move. And do it. Is he going to answer? Heck no, he could care less about me. He knows there's no cows in heat in the area or else there'd be competitive bugling out there. I would know there's nothing. 
but I'm going to change that. I'm going to show him I've got one. So now I sit there for about two minutes. I do it again. After a couple minutes go by, That's about, I do it again. I sit there, don't do anything. I get pretty comfortable. I've done this so many times, lots. Because I know he ain't going to say anything. <clears throat> Lethargic, lazy bed bugle if I heard anything at all from him. I know he's up there a couple hundred yards. And incidentally, before I go to the next move, I call nearly every single bull like this from uphill down to me. I rarely try to get on each level with them. I like to give them the feeling that they have the momentum if they have to come down. You know, and so, and the wind is usually coming down because I'm killing these guys right when they get to the bedding area. And that's where I kill every bull. I kill them in their bedding area. So I'm getting on the perimeter of it. I make the two cow call, two sets. Now I introduce a bull. After those two sets, I now bring a bull in that has come on the scene and I start raking. And I start thrashing. And I start raking. And I rake a little bit more. I start out light and I just start thrashing. And I'm watching the whole time and listening. Rake a little bit more. For this cow, I'm, a bull has come in and now is displaying for this cow. Don't you think I got that bull's attention? You better believe it. I've got his attention. He's not moving. He's not doing anything. But I have his attention. So that means any little sound I make after this, I have him. He is hearing it. If I started out with those little sounds to begin with, he may not have heard him. But I've got his attention. And so once I do that, I start escalating it. I'm going into the raking. And that's when I start giving some more pants, kind of a and i go through just little sounds like that i'm showing my emotion my yearning my, my treasure i found right here and i start raking and i start thrashing again and then i take my little tube it's my glunker and i isn't that really good sound you ever heard bulls glunk that's what they sound you can do this it don't sound the same this one is amazing and Why does a bull glunk? There's a reason why a bull glunks. Most bulls are going to glunk in the presence of a cow, especially hot cows. As a, as, a, as, a, as a cow comes into heat, she emits an airborne chemical called a pheromone. So do dogs. They emit this and it gets into the air. And it, this is what brings a lot of these satellites around where the herd is that has a hot cow. Well, here's a bull right there. And the, it can feel the air so much it gets pungent and thick, to, so to speak. And they start tasting it. And they start slapping their tongue against the roof of their mouth. And that's the best explanation. I've even talked to biologists that felt that, you know, because elk don't talk and tell you this. But that's the best ex explanation they have with it, that this is the only time you hear it. You don't hear it outside of that when they're walking around just doing it for nothing. But you'll hear them do it when they're close to the cows in heat. It's giving that sound. And so as I let him, this bull know, now I'm tasting the air. I'm not only smelling, I'm tasting. I'm showing the excitement. I'm panting. <laughs> Those are the sounds I go to. I'm not even talking to him. Nothing. I'm talking to my cow. And I start raking some more and I'm thrashing. And now, here's when the bull answers right here. I've set him up. I've seen this. I can't tell you how many times. The third set of cow sounds. When I start going... You're just a little bit more whiny with it because the bull's hooking her. He's messing with her and you're thrashing. I mean, you're painting this picture in his mind's eye of what's going on. Usually, in that, I've never had him hardly ever answer the bugle. Not until he answers the cow call first. And now I'm waiting for him because as soon as I hit him with that third one, as I've gone through that display and I'm painting that picture that this bull has a hot cow. Because if he had a hot cow, that's the sounds he would be making right there. And I listen for that stuff. Other bulls listen for it. So now I have him convinced that I have a hot cow. And now he gives me a short roundup to the cow. He's trying to call her over there. And a bull, depending on his emotion, it changes. Okay, it's like if you're talking to somebody and if you raise your voice, oh, wait, he raised it a little bit more. Now he's yelling. You see, as people, that's what elk do. The first sound, he might go. Oh. He's, telling, he's calling the cow over. That's who he's wanting. He does it. He wants her. And when he does, I usually just go and let him know I don't want him. I don't go. There's none of this challenge bugle. This bull's not in that frame of mind. There's no way I'm going to hammer him with a big lip ball and scream my head off and go pedal to the metal. It's not time. 
I'm going to get there, but it's not time. So as soon as I give him that, I now have the, call, the cow call him over. When a cow has separation from other elk, she will call them back. As they're moving through the timber, you'll hear them. And it's just social. But if, when they're moving through, if one gets separated, especially junior or any of them from a century lead cow to a mom, you know, it's a maternity type thing, is they don't hear them. Where'd they go? They're in the timber. She doesn't see them. So now she tries to call them back. She changes her tone. Can she use the same sound? Same cow saw? How, how would that make any sense? Does a bull use the same sound for gathering his cows, challenging, warning, inviting? No. He changes the tone, the emotion of it. That's what the cow does. And here's the sound she'll use. You'll hear her do this. And she's raising the volume. Why? It's like if you had your kid out there and he got separated. Hey, Joey, la da da da. Now all of a sudden Joey's not there. You go, Joey? Joey! No answer. Joey! I mean, you're getting concerned. Where is he? He's not answering. This is what the elk are doing. When they get separated and they're trying to call one back, they will raise their voice and change the emotion of the sound. They make a sound like this. And they'll reach out trying to call them. You can start a little lower. The point, I'm just trying to show you the tone. They'll start and they can slowly raise it and even lengthen it until they get a satisfying response or a visual that the elk is coming back. So it's the same thing as if you're talking to, if we told our wife, hey, come on over here. You told your kid, come on over here. You told a coworker, you're saying the same thing. That's what I do to the bull. I now call him over with the cow sound. So now I'm making the cow call the bull. She's choosing the bull. Not the one she's with. She is inviting this bull over. And though I usually hit her with three or four sounds. And when I do, the bull usually hits me right back. I mean immediately to call this cow. And when he does, I'm waiting for him. I'm still raking. I'm still doing it. She hits it out of nowhere. And now I cut him off with a little bit more of a motion. More of a... <laughs> letting him know. I don't appreciate that at all. Now, you've heard people talk about lip balls. You have to understand when an elk uses an elk sound, he can elevate his game or his emotion. A lip ball, when a bull uses a lip ball, that is the top limit of the emotion that he can go to. He, there's, no other, there's no other height. He's at the top. And so when you hear him give a, 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 a tone like this, then he raises the tone or he shortens, he gets louder. You can see his emotion change for the situation at hand. So now I'm waiting. A lip ball will end up coming. Once I get this bull to engage... I usually will now hear at least 10 to 15 bugles as that bull starts coming in. He starts coming in because now as he starts doing this, I, I, I throw him another curve. I have the cow demand him to come over. And so that's when I hit. This is just telling that bull to get over there. She wants him to come. And when I do that, the bull usually just, he's done. He's going absolutely bananas. I'm going to have to cut him off several times. I take over the situation. I no longer let him call and me answer him. I now switch roles. I make him answer me every time. And once I make him answer me, I put him on the defense. So now we're going back and forth. And usually the final sound he hears from me as he's coming, because sometimes he'll stop at that 60, 70 yard and he's calling as I hit him with the that's the end of it right there. That is the, uh, when a bull makes a sound like that, that's like the, lo the, the, the line drawn in the sand. Don't you dare come across that right there. I mean, this is how, this is their game, their threat to each other. And more times than not, he can answer with that, but here he comes, he's right there on top of me. And guys, we call bull after bull after bull after bull. Even satellites will come in like that. But we get them to engage. They do not sneak in. They all engage. So when you can get those quiet bulls like that, I've done it with herd bulls that never made a sound. I just saw them go into the timber. I try to get within the 200 yards. They'll leave their cows to come over to check out this hot one. Why? They don't have a cow in estrus. They don't care about leaving them. It's not a problem. Nothing's going to come and bother them. There's not even a bull bugling them. It's because there's no cows in heat. And so when I plant that seed, here's what I have here. 
You still showing some photos up there? You see all these elk that we've been putting down? That's how we're getting, killing a ton of them. They're with the slow play. They're with the raking early season or, or, the, or, the, or, or the advertising. Now, when I come on a hot bull, where a bull is already aggressive and I can hear the cows and I can hear him screaming. Perfect example of that was the bull I called in for my son last year. I'm, I actually give you the exact account. <clears throat> Pretty much the exact account. I won't start in the beginning of it. But what happened was we, were, we got out of the rig and we could hear cows calling up the hill. Right off of a dirt road over the counter. Just happened to be one of those mornings. It was raining. Hardly anybody wanted to go out. We get out of the truck and I can hear cows calling. Just They're out there and you could hear them. And they're way up the hill. I don't know where they were when we finally started up after them, but I'm going to say 250, 300, and I could hear them going up. I've hunted this area before. Thick, thick, thick stuff. And as they went up, I thought, I told my son, I mean, we got to get up there. And it's, there's no trail. There's no, there's no nothing there. It's just tons of downfall, thick underbrush, just really dark stuff. And as we started going up there, a bull bugled. And he's bugling those cows because I hadn't bugled. And he's bugling the cows to come on up. And... <clears throat> For some reason, they were all below him. For whatever the reason, it really didn't matter to me. But I could tell he was trying to pull them up. We got up there to what I thought we were around 300 yards from him. And I know I could call him in from 300 yards. If I did the right thing, I could call him in. And so I got up there. We set up real quick. I'd already killed the bull, so it was my son's turn. And I immediately hit a bugle just to see where he was. And I kind of hit him with a... No location bugle. Here's my location bugle, just so you can see what the difference is. That's what I do. That's how I locate bulls, and I will move around until I finally find one. Well, as you can see, that was not how that other one was. It was, had, had a little more emotion behind it. <clears throat> and what I basically was doing, it can, it, can, it can redirect the cows, is what I was doing, which irritates the bull. So... No, I didn't use a herding type sound and lip, but I don't need to get to that yet. Right now, I was just trying to make contact, let the cows know there's another bull right there that they might be interested in. Of course, I knew they weren't going to come, but it was to light him up. And when I did, I realized, oh, that bull's up a lot higher than I thought he was. So we ran up a second one. Again, this is an aggressive situation. We run up because he was further away than I thought. We get up to a couple more benches up, and I mean, it's like this. We're going straight up. As we get to the second bench, we set up, do it again. I'll be dang that bull still further than I thought he was. <clears throat> so we get up there on a third setup. I'm like, oh, I heard the bull bugle. And I can still hear the cows. They're still between us. So I get up on the third setup and I now I call the cows. So now I'm kind of giving it. I'm not getting too aggressive, but. <laughs> so I just give just a, a nice mild little lip ball, which is directed to the cows more than anything. I want them to come over here. Well, of course, I know they're not going to. But the bull did not like that. He immediately hammered me instantly, and I cut him off. Well, before you know it, I started raking. I, my son was sitting on a bench like this. I was just on the lower side, 15 yards under him, raking a tall willow and just thrashing, raking. I'm just hitting this thing with the antlers and just smashing, smashing, smashing. And I throw out another bugle. He answers. I go over the top of him, hit him with a second one, and here he comes. All you could hear is a bull coming. This bull came in so fast on that third setup. He was at 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, five yards right on my son, running full blast. And I'm just over the edge. And I see my son like this, like this, like this, you know, and I'm like, what is going on? And he told me, well, all of a sudden I hear, whoosh, I hear the arrow and I start screaming three or four behind me and he's hammering, trying to slow him down. I start bugling, bugling, bugling. And he's just standing there looking the other way. And so I go up there and he, I start, I, what I do is I look at him, he turns around and I literally, his eyeballs were as big as silver dollars. And he's just staring at me like in disbelief. And he's not a little kid. My kid, he's 41 right now. And he's just staring at me. And I start walking up like, what? I mean, you miss him? What? He says, daddy says, you ain't going to believe it. That bull was literally coming right at me to run me over. He wasn't even running down the side. He was coming to impale you. There was no messing around. And I don't know if some of you, you know, the, where's the bulls? That's him right there. That's a really nice over-the-counter bull, isn't it? And that's the bull right there. 
And anyway, as he came at him, he said, I saw him at 30. He, and my son shoots like me. He has three pins. We got 20, 30, 40. And he said, my pins were just dancing on him. And it was just, he's going to stop any second. He's going to stop. And he says, when he hit five yards, it was just, whew. he says, I let him have it right there, which I think that's the eighth bull he's killed with a frontal. He knew what he's doing. He's no, you know, he's not a little kid. That was his 29th bull. And he hit the bull right there. And so when I went up there, well, what happened? What? And he goes, right. And he's looking. And I mean, from here to that lady, that bull's laying there dead. Right there. Didn't move. I mean, he, he went over there. He quivered a little bit. And down he went. Actually, he was shooting with an iron wheel broadhead. You guys might have heard of those. They came out with him a couple of years. That's what he shot him with. I was shooting the same head. But anyway, we wanted to try him out. But he hit that bull right there. That is a fast action. You don't need a slow play. You don't need a, a, a advertising sequence. You see, none of that's necessary for a bull that's fully aggressive. And, 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 and if I wanted to, I, I knew he was aggressive. When I got a bull with a hot cow a lot of times, I, I, I might change it up a little bit because they're not all screamers like that where they're just cutting you off and going like crazy. There's sometimes I got to get a bull worked up because he has a cow coming into heat, but she's not ready to be bred. She's just showing signs. And I, so what I need to do is I need to get in there. And I like getting in that 100, 125 yard mark. Maybe there's a couple satellites harassing him and I call the cow from him. Now, here's what a satellite does when she tries to call, he tries to call the cow away. <clears throat> Again, I've watched him do this I don't know how many times. These satellites get in and they start cow calling her. And what they do is they cow call her and hit her with a roundup instantly, no hesitation. There's no question that that sound is coming from that bull. And you'll hear him kind of give a... <coughs> and that's what he'll do all in one motion. And when you do that, don't you think you get that herd bull's attention right there? Because what does the herd bull think? Who are you talking to? He knows you're talking to that cow. And no question in his mind, you've directed that emotion, that response to that cow. And I know he's going to call. And as soon as he bugles over me, I cut him off. And now I, I try to call the gal again. I'm not interested in him. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm trying to get that cow out of there. And why is it? Because I know there's a hot cow. I can tell by the satellites her, her being, you know, harassing him. And what are they doing? They're trying to call the cow out of there. So when you have multiple bulls harassing a herd bull, are they trying to fight the herd bull? No. They're not trying to fight the herd bull. They walk in there and, and, and challenge him. They stay back and try to call the hot cow out. And they do this because how do they know which cow's hot? There could be six of them. There could be 22 of them. You think she's wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm the hot cow? He doesn't know. So they try to call her out, guys. That's what they do. They smell the pheromones in the air, and they get so excited. They have the same urges as the herd bull does. And so they sit back advertising themselves. You'll hear these bulls going nuts and they're staying back and they're trying to call the cow out of there. They're trying to, to, to show that they're a possible breeder bull and they go on and on. But what I do is I get inside of those satellites. I try to get inside them as long as the wind and the cover is there. And then I immediately take my call and call the cow. And when I do, it's absolutely magical. If I walked in, now there are bulls where I can just scream like the one I called for my son. He was that frame of mind. But when I get those that I'm a little bit less cautious, he's not quite there. He's not giving me the emotion I'm looking for for a bull that's on full tilt or full send. I need to work him up to that. And now I'm going to hammer him. I may give him that nervous grunt and that one stink, that one hard, hard challenge at the end. Right when the time is right. Again, it's those ingredients. Use the ingredients, but use them proportionally at the right time. So those are the little things that we're doing. Yeah, and I'm raking and I'm thrashing as I'm trying to call that cow. Why? Because I'm displaying for her. I'm not trying to challenge the bull with the raking. I am trying to draw the cow over. There's been many a times as I change gears here really quick, many a bulls that I killed. I've killed several really nice six points with a longbow. <clears throat> I've had the bull call me to him. And what this means is I've got the bull going but I know he has cows. He must have something coming in. And again, it's pure speculation on my part because you just can't tell what every little situation is. All you can go on is what they're tossing you, what they're saying, what their, what their, what their action is. And when I have a bull, when I give him a cow call a lot of times, and you have a bull just light up, then you, have, then you can throw a bugle out there and what happened? He doesn't say nothing. 
There's days like that. There's days you're going to give a bugle and he goes nuts. You give cow calls, nothing. You can't get him to do a thing. Remember that. When he gives a cow call, when I'm giving the cow call and he calls to me, I know that every time a bull responds to a cow call, he's calling the cow to him. That's what he's doing. He's giving her a direction to get over there. Come on over. And so in time, if that cow doesn't come, the bull will raise his aggression or raise his emotion trying to call the cow. He will even get to a challenge bugle. And a lot of guys are like, no way. Bulls don't challenge cows. Well, what they don't understand is bulls don't look at it like that. It's an emotional tone. It's an emotional sound to them. Just like a cow sound is to a cow. They change the cadence to change the meaning or the message. So a bull doesn't look at a lip ball as a lip ball. He looks at it as a tone or, or a sense of emotion for his frame of mind for the situation he's in. And so will a bull challenge a hot cow or any cow? Well, of course he does. It's just a change of emotion to him. He's pissed because that cow's not coming as he's asked her to for the last 10 minutes. If you sit there and keep hanging up, the bull's not hanging up. You, the hunter's hanging up. He's told you to come over. You just don't know it. If you don't go to him because he's not coming, you, that's your chance. It'll anchor him. So now when a cow accepts the invite, this is a different sound. I, forgot, I didn't know I was going to get there, but I'm going to. Am I talking too long here? But <clears throat> this is a sound that a cow will use when she accepts the invite. And here's how I've killed those bulls with a longbow. And I mean, I'm getting close. I've killed them at 14, 17, just under 20. And they, and they start raking. And what I was getting at from the raking that I was doing for the herd bull as I was trying to call the cow is when a bull is calling a cow, as he invites her and she accepts the invite, he starts raking and displaying for her. Why? He's showing off for her. It's like a guy going out to a bar or something, splashing after shaving, shaving and making him clean himself up. That's his way of trying to, you know, attract the opposite sex at times. Well, a, cow, a bull doesn't do that. He's kind of a little different. He pees all over himself and he's screaming and he's raking and he smells like crap out there. And they really do. You guys know you've killed elk. I mean, they, they're not the best fragrance out there. But the point is, is it's an attractant. And so when he starts raking and as I'm coming in, I make this sound right here. And it's because I've called so many cows in with a bugle. And here's the sound they make when they're coming into me. Some are silent, but a lot of them are like this. You ever heard cows do that? So it is the strangest thing. You're only going to hear it when they're accepting something and they're excited and they go right at it. This is not a social thing that you're going to hear all the time. But over the years, I've bugled in a lot of cows. And you're going to do that when you've called for almost 40 years doing that, you know, between rifle and bow hunting. You're going to hear a lot of stuff, especially when you're out there constantly. And when I first heard that, it was probably 25 years ago. And I've used that many times. Now, I'm not saying if you give normal cow sound and you go at the bull, that it'll never work. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is I love using that same sound they're using on me when they're coming right at me. The first time it ever happened, <clears throat> I thought it was a hunter. I honestly did. I mean, it was so off the wall and something I had never heard like that, that I thought a hunter was coming in. And then I kept hearing more and more and more. Well, that first occasion, I'll never forget it, was six cows. And they were all hammering away and they all ran probably within 15 to 20 yards from me. Some had their tongues hanging out. They were running so far, but I could hear them coming. And I mean, even though I thought it was a hunter because I'd never heard the sound, I just, as they closed the distance, there was no question about it. Now I'm seeing them. But I've used that sound ever since on certain situations. Yeah, there's years go by, I never use it. But when it's time for it, oh yeah, I'll use that thing. I have actually used that for over 300 yards. It took me over 20 minutes to get to the brush through it. It was so thick. It was just tearing at me. And I'm just hitting that sound and I stop for 15, 20 seconds. I'm trying to crawl and get through it. And the bull is just screaming and going and going. And I'm making my way, making my way. I mean, almost 20 minutes it took me and he never moved an inch, not one inch. He waited for that cow to come all the way to him. And in most cases, you're going to find the bull. Once you get to that 40, 50, I, that's when I knock an arrow. I'd never knock an arrow as I'm running. I just don't do it. I just don't think it's smart. So I don't, I would never recommend it. I don't care if something pops up in between you and them, let them go. You know, elk isn't worth your life out there. And so right about that distance, that's when I knock an arrow. I make sure I am looking for other elk. I've been busted so many times. Try, you know, you get tunnel vision sometimes because you hear them, hear them, hear them. And then all of a sudden there's a cow and a spike right there. You didn't even see them. I'm, I mean, feet away from you. And they're just standing there with you. Stare. You think they had to run off already, but no. 
They stay right there. And until they bust out of there, and then everything goes to heck there, and you, you lose them. But the point is, is that you go ahead and listen to him rake, but I've killed enough bulls where they'll let you come. They, you're doing what they're asking. They're asking that cow to come and join him. And so, boom, I'm taking the invitation, accepting it, calling my way right to him, and you cannot believe how they'll just stay right there. I can remember the last six point I killed. I got up there, and he was probably, I, I mean, I could hear him bugling. And I, I caught up into a tree. There's a fir tree where all the limbs were coming down. And I get right in it, and I don't wear any face paint. I don't, cam, I don't wear anything. I'm just camoed up. And I got right in the limbs, and I've got my longbow. I've got an arrow, and I'm staring. I'm like, he's just right there. I know he is. I mean, he sounded like he was 20 yards away. And the hill went like this, just like that. And down there was this big log. And I mean, this log was this high about 35 yards and I am looking through the tree I mean I just know he's right there and I happen to look over the log and all I see is his eyes nose his ears and his rack six point and he's just staring just like that right at me and but I'm looking through all these limbs coming down I didn't expose myself and I'm like oh no way he's right and now I'm sitting here it was a standoff I'm sitting there I'm not making a sound I'm not making a move I'm doing nothing I'm just staring at him he's staring at me all of a sudden he jumps the log and he starts coming up the hill. I'm like, no way. I mean, how many times that happened? Seriously. He jumps the log and he starts walking up, walking up. And he's coming, coming. He gets up and he's, now he's up on my same level. And I'm next to this tree really tight. And I'm like, I have no shot. I have nothing. These limbs are out like this. And I was trying to stay covered because I didn't know where he was. And I'm sitting there and I, I don't know if he could hear my heartbeat or not. But I don't even know if I took a breath. I, I'm not kidding you. I am just sitting there locked on him. I'm not trying to move. And this bull is 20 yards. And I see a big downfall between us. There's a lot of crap. And to my right is a granite piece of stone. And it's probably really close to this high. And it kind of sloped. And I was like, man, if I could just get to that rock. I need to get up to that rock. Because I need to get and look over some of this stuff. There's crap everywhere. He walks. He stops at 17 yards. And when he does, he's looking the other way. There's a limb coming right through here, right by his side. And I'm like, oh, I can't take that shot. I want to draw. So, because you know, longbow, you, you shoot fast. I mean, you're just, whew, it's gone. There's no pins. There's no nothing. And it's like, I can't take it. I can't take it. If I take that shot and I hit that limb, you know, it's not a compound where I'm, I'm two inches left, two inches right, he's dead. It's different with, at least for me it is, I couldn't take the shot. So he stood there. He's not even looking at me. He's just looking away. He turns and he walks to an aspen tree. He's maybe 22 yards and he starts raking it. And he's raking. He's thrashing, raking. He's digging it with his brow tines. And I'm watching. I'm like, that's my chance to get on my rock. So I get up on that rock. Man, I'm sitting there. I shoot three fingers under with a tab. And I'm sitting just like this, waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm saying, come on. Whatever you do, you got to come back to the right. If you go to the left, I got nothing. And I'm talking three feet to the left. I got nothing. He'll walk out of my life. I'm like, please come back to the right. You know, I just, you go through these things. You just do, you know, you're nuts out there and you're just sitting there waiting. And all of a sudden, after about 30 seconds, he stops, he turns and he faces me and he's standing, I'm going to say maybe 20, 22 yards roughly. And he just screams a bugle. He screams around them. He wants that cow. I mean, just hammers it. And I mean, I'm just like, I mean, it's almost like a fan came in my face. It really didn't, but you envision it like that. I mean, he's so close. And when he screams, he, saw, he just settles down and he turns and he's walking at me and he decides he's going to go back the way he came, which was what I needed him to do. And as soon as he hit that one spot where there was a little opening, all I did was just go with my mouth. I didn't have a, I just went <laughs> just like that. And I drew and he stopped. And when I did, the arrow went right through his heart and I watched him run over the edge. I looked over the edge and he was laying there piled up. It's about 60 yards away, stone dead. But what a deal. And I, I, he called me to him, that particular bull. But that is exactly what took place of everything worked out. Got a little lucky, got behind the tree, jumped on the rock. Didn't see me jump on the rock, but you never know, you know, some of the situations that you're going to be in. But if I would have never took the initiative to go after that bull, and Cal called my way to him. I'd have never got that bull. He would have just left and he would have been out of there. Over the counter, I probably killed him a mile off the road. He's probably been called to who knows how many times. That's how you kill a bull that has been harassed many times. When you get on a bull and you're bugling him and you're going through all your cow calls and your bugles and everything. And he won't come because he's been, he's suspicious. He's hearing something out of the ordinary that he knows isn't one that's living in the area. But many times when you go to the cow call and he answers it. Go to him. That's about your only chance. And he'll wait for you. He hasn't been busted by that. But if you try to bugle him and set up, he's going to hang up, hang up, hang up. And the next thing you know, 
His bugles are more distant, more distant, more distant. But go at him. I showed that to a buddy of mine. He came into camp. He was in an issue where he had built bulls like that. I told him, I said, the next time you go there, he went out in the morning. He said, I told him, I said, the next time you get in that situation, he was 40 yards from a bull that was so thick, but he never thought, oh, hell, call and just walk in on him. And I said, dude, he goes, this guy sounds like a dinosaur out there. And I said, just go at him. I said, Cal, call your way and go right at him. He ended up shooting that bull at 10 yards. He was 360 inches over the counter. I've never killed a 360 inch bull. And he's in the same area as me. <laughs> I mean, you just never know what can happen. But you see, it's just some of those little things that if you don't take the initiative and the aggressive action, in most cases, I'm calling these bulls to me, but there are times. You know, I'll share one more thing and then I'll, I'll stop. One of the things that a lot of hunters ask me, I get, I get hundreds and hundreds of calls and emails and PMs. They say, what do you do when you have a bull and he is screaming and he's, you know, he, he, he wants to die. He, he really does. I mean, he, this guy is ripe. And, but you got satellites all around you. They're in the front. You, they're maybe hanging around each side. You got cows right there between you. And that's the way the wind's coming. What do you do with that bull? Well, I have a little trick for that bull. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I've used it before and we, we killed a really nice bull. I've used it more than once. But here's what I do. When that happens and I'm slipping in, I'm slipping in because he's so vocal, I don't need to say anything yet. I can just slip in and I'm getting, you know, like a couple hundred yards and all of a sudden I see these other elk. I'm like, oh. So what I do is I get back, to, I crawl back to about 400 yards. It works slick. As soon as I get there, I start bugling my way to him. About every 50 yards, I just sit there. <laughs> 50 yards, do it again. How many times have we ever bugled our way to a bull and he stands right there and you can go put an arrow on him? Like never. If you bugle your way to a bull nine times out of ten, he just keeps that distance between you. He keeps pushing, pushing, pushing. He doesn't just stand right there. I found this out quite a few years ago. If I get back and bugle him, the cows, the, the, the satellites, everything, they don't run off. They just kind of push to the side. They get back because they don't want to tolerate it. And it gives me that corridor, that opening. I can get into that bull, and now I can try to cause hot cowway because he's so aggressive. And that's usually what I'll do with that bull. I will not go in there and just start screaming at him. I usually will try to attempt to call the cow away with the couple of cow sounds, the little roundup, and I'm ready for him. I know what he's going to do as soon as I do that. And just bam, bam, bam. But my point is, is clearing the path. That's how I clear the path. I don't cow call my way in. I bugle my way in about every 50, 70 yards. And you'll notice those bulls just go, they want nothing to do with you. And they part. But does the herd bull run? No. Why doesn't he? He's got three other bulls that have been harassing him two hours. You think one more is going to make him run? No. They stay right there. And they pace back and forth, back and forth. And he's got the hot cow there. And the other ones aren't hot. They're just part of the herd. But my point is, it's just a, a, a little tactic, a little trick that you can use sometimes when, when, when you just can't do anything else. You can't just bull rush them and hope they stay there and watch everything go blown out of there. I got a bunch of tactics for that too. But, but anyway, I will go ahead and end it right there. Um, do you want question and answer? Or no, it's too late. Or I mean, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yeah, but. I think what? Yeah. <laughs> 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 take a quick break and then we'll bring both you and Chris up for some questions after they do their demo. Does that sound okay? To you? Okay, yeah, if you guys have any, but hey, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it, man, a lot, guys. Thank you.